Railways have an incredible ability to shape our world, whether winding through the jungle, stretching across a desert, or even moving underneath an entire city, infrastructure like this has the power to level up economies and transform travel for millions of people. Here we've rounded up some of our favourite and most epic railway construction stories from right around the world. So step on board, sit back, relax and enjoy this incredible journey. Mexico. If you're looking for sandy beaches, ancient ruins and a taco or two, then this is your place. Every year, tourists flock to popular sites along this stretch of land called the Yucatan Peninsula. But getting here isn't easy, and bus rides to some of these hotspots can take several hours at best. Until now. Mexico is building a massive new railway across the peninsula called Tren Maya. Over 1,500 kilometers of track will run through the jungle, connecting major ruin sites, beaches and hotels. But ever since construction began, the project's faced a serious backlash, and works have even been halted on some occasions. Environmentalists and indigenous communities say the train poses a threat to the region, and they want the current plans derailed. I am not systematically against the train. I am against the train the way it's being done right now. Meanwhile, officials passionately believe that the positive economic gains will far outweigh any negatives and are running the project full speed ahead. Welcome to the $10 billion railway in the jungle. Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula is the place to be. Nestled in the country's southeastern corner between the Caribbean Sea and the Gulf of Mexico, there's white sand, snorkeling and resorts. But it wasn't always like this. Fifty years ago, many big cities in the region were still relatively undeveloped, and much of the economy relied on agriculture. Then, in the 1970s, Mexico began building hotels and airports in cities like Cozumel and Cancun. Now, millions flock here every year. But long before the tourists arrived, this area was home to one of the largest Mayan communities, a historical civilization of indigenous people dating back thousands of years. Many of the structures they built, like pyramids and temples, still exist today, and they've become popular spots for sightseeing. Chichen Itza is one of those Mayan cities full of ancient ruins. Tourists normally navigate these destinations through Mexico's bus network, starting in Cancun. But it can all be a bit slow. The ride to Chichen Itza is a six-hour round trip at best, and that's a lot of time to spend on a bus. To sort this all out, in 2018, the country announced one of its biggest infrastructure projects yet, a 1,500km rail network called the Mayan Train, or Tren Maya in Espanol. It'll start from Cancun Airport and loop around the Yucatan Peninsula, stopping at places like Chichen Itza, Tulum and the Riviera Maya, a cracking stretch of Caribbean coastline. Most of the route will go through areas that have already been cleared for use, including over the tracks of a previous rail network that was never fully completed. 21 stations, 17 stops and 42 trains on its rails, the network could transport over 40,000 passengers every day as well as cargo. The near $10 billion project is headed by the National Fund for the Promotion of Tourism, or FONATUR, a Mexican government agency, and it's funded by tourist taxes. When it opens, passengers are going to be able to ride on one of three types of trains, standard, restaurant and long-term stay trains. Their exterior design is inspired by Mayan culture, and they can reach speeds of up to 160 kilometers an hour. That's quite a bit faster than a bus. Construction started in 2020, and it's going to be completed in seven sections across two major phases, with the first aiming to open in 2023. The northern section will connect Cancun and Playa del Carmen, while the southern run will link the southern portion of Playa del Carmen to Tulum, and this phase will be fully electric. Construction teams are working on sites that stretch over huge distances, contending with remote locations, a jungle environment, and that extreme heat and humidity. 
Now, despite being led by Mexico's tourism agency, the train's out to benefit a lot more than just the tourists. It promises to generate thousands of local jobs and contribute to the economic development of the Yucatan Peninsula. But not everyone is aboard for the ride. Some fear Tren Maya won't economically benefit the smaller communities it aims to connect and will simply serve tourists and the wealthy, or that only more established resorts will seek gains. While construction is making use of the previous train network, these tracks are being widened because of new train technology. And that's where the biggest controversy lies. Wider tracks means more people and more landscape being cleared to make way. Now, many locals are pushing back. The list of legal issues people have with the project is long. Over 25 injunctions have been filed so far. Despite the train having Maya in its name and design, many indigenous communities are strongly opposed to it. They say it threatens existing and potentially undiscovered historic sites. Officials are supposed to notify communities about the project, but indigenous leaders claim they weren't fully informed of the extent of the train's impact and that only the benefits were mentioned. They also say many of these meetings weren't presented in the locals' first language. The Mexican government maintains it made agreements with the local communities by holding assemblies and continues to offer a permanent open dialogue. As for the unknown sites, well, a team of archaeologists from Fonatur has been working to document anything excavated along the route. And so far, they've recorded more than 19,000 artefacts and 160 burials. But artefacts aren't the only thing being uprooted. The last year, the Mexican government announced that they needed to um, evict about 3,000 families in the whole um, Yucatan Peninsula. Um, in Campeche City, there were like 300 uh, families about to get evicted. While some have been offered housing, many aren't pleased with that alternative. The housing in mining communities are different from the Western house. They have a different design and different dynamics. Sometimes that there are some really strong doubts about the materials that they are using because you can just use any material in any place because you have the climate, the weather, the geography and other factors that you have to really um, take care about because that could um, compromise the quality of life of some families in their houses. Meanwhile, a rail project connecting Mexico's famous beaches to archaeological sites has become a major environmental hazard. With parts of the track running directly through rainforests, savannas and mangroves, many activists are concerned about its impact on the peninsula's endangered species. If you open up a new avenue for fragmentation and for colonization by people, that is going to destroy the jaguar habitat in that area. There's no place for that train to go along that route in the south of the Yucatan Peninsula. So far, construction has already led to 120 square kilometers of jungle being cleared and nearly 9 million trees being chopped down. This is the largest rainforest north of the Panama Isthmus. The next one is the Amazon. We cannot afford to lose it to this kind of thing. The government argues that trains are more environmentally friendly than highways and that the railway's impact won't be too extensive because most of the route runs through existing tracks. Officials also say mitigation strategies like overpasses and underpasses will allow wildlife to cross safely. But that's not enough for some opponents. A mega project can work and would benefit people. It takes like between 55 to 30 years through the design and implementation. Here is the opposite. They are in a rush. Until recently, the project has shown no signs of touching the brakes. But then in 2022, Trenmire faced setbacks when the government announced part of it would be suddenly rerouted. The hotels in, in Cancun and Tulum and all of that area decided that they did not want the train right there because it, it was going to disrupt the traffic to the hotels. The new route would go over an historic and sacred set of underwater caverns, a move that could put them at the risk of collapsing. 
That aquifer is absolutely the key for the development of, uh, of life in the peninsula, human life or natural life. We lose that, that's the end of the peninsula. People voiced their concerns and a court ordered a temporary suspension. Not too long after that, construction of another section of the track was temporarily suspended. While many communities have voiced their opposition to Trenmire, several others welcome the train's proposed economic impact. Government figures show about 80% of communities are in support of the project, with many pointing out that parts of the jungle have been cleared out before for similar developments. The United Nations Human Settlements believes the project will cut poverty by 15% and double economic growth by 2030. The train would allow local farms to transport goods more easily. It's clear there are mixed opinions on both sides of the tracks, but despite the disagreements, Rodrigo hopes to meet somewhere in the middle. We really need to hit the brakes and, and think about a better territorial arrangement, territorial organization of what we want to do with the Yucatan Peninsula, together with the Maya, together with everyone, every stakeholder needs to be part of that discussion. This city has big plans, and when we say big, we mean big. Skyscrapers, the Olympic Games, massive new mega projects pushing the bounds of engineering. And it's all happening down under. The next decade will see a transformation on an international scale, and it's all beginning right now with the biggest infrastructure project in the state's history. A new metro that burrows under the city itself. But this isn't Sydney or Melbourne, this is Brisbane, Australia's fastest growing city. Now, if you haven't heard of Brisbane before, then you're not alone. But the city has lofty ambitions. That much was clear when it won the bid for the 2032 Olympic Games. That the Games of the 35th Olympiad are awarded to Brisbane, Australia. <laughs> Brisbane is Australia's third largest city, but it's growing at a phenomenal rate. Around a thousand people move into the region every week. While the Olympics are a part of Brisbane's rebranding as an international destination, it won the bid precisely because of the city's commitment to its ambitions and the massive new infrastructure already being planned. That includes the $6.3 billion mega-project Cross River Rail. It's a 102 kilometer rail line with 5.9 kilometers of twin tunnels that dive under the Brisbane River and Central Business District. Essentially, they're building a massive new railway right below downtown Brisbane. The project includes four new underground stations and eight upgraded stations, plus the development of three new Gold Coast stations. Beyond that, what you've got is uh, a network that is, hasn't been upgraded for quite some time. And so we've got uh, stations in the inner suburbs, which some of them date back to when they were first built were in the late 1800s. That's Graham. He knows a lot about this project. So I'm the um, CEO of the Cross River Rail Delivery Authority. It's really the biggest infrastructure project in the city's history, in the centre. And what it'll do is change the way in which people actually move around the city. Cross River Rail seeks to rectify a major problem with Brisbane itself. You see, the city is defined by its river, for better or worse. And this river is a beast. The Brisbane River is quite a large river. It's tidal uh, and several hundred metres wide, and it's quite deep. Um, so it cre creates a bit of a barrier, and it sort of separates the city um, from you know, north to south. But it's a meandering river as well, too. Right now, there's only one crossing over the river, separating the city into two distinct halves. In 1979, there was a bridge built across the river, uh, but that's really the only crossing, and that constrains the the way in which the rail network can, can operate. Um, it constrains it to 24 trains per hour. Cross River Rail provides a second crossing of that river, but actually goes under the river. The new railway will ease pressure on the current rail network, which is nearing capacity. And this transformation that we're doing basically unblocks that bottleneck that's in the middle of the city, which is, is really tied to that historical development. So we're, we're really sort of unshackling the core of the city. 
Untying this knot will unlock enormous economic potential as well as revitalising previously disconnected precincts. The construction of the rail itself already provides the city with 1,500 jobs a year. There's a business case too. One report predicts the project's benefits will outweigh the costs by 1.9 billion Australian dollars. And for every dollar invested, the project will return $1.41 in benefits for Queenslanders. The development, you know, in some economic forecasting multipliers take it to sort of 15 to 20 billion dollars worth of growth and in the order of 35,000 jobs around just basically as a result of the uh, interconnectedness that you're going to get out of having the, the rail system and then the development around those. Perhaps the most important reason for the construction of Cross River Rail is the population explosion the region is expected to have. The population of South East Queensland is forecast to grow from 3.5 million today to 4.9 million in 2036. In just a few years, that puts the region on par with Melbourne and Sydney. More than 80% of this growth is going to happen just outside Brisbane, while at the same time, 45% of job growth is going to occur in the Brisbane metropolitan area. This means that jobs are continuing to sprout up in the city, while people are moving to the suburbs surrounding it. And there's a vital need for better public transportation to connect the two. The stations really are adjacent to the CBD, uh, so that means you, travelling public, have to walk about 10, 15 minutes really to get to the centre of the CBD from the railway stations. Not to mention, these new stations will link up with the Olympic Stadium, transporting the millions of expected tourists in 2032. But building under a major metropolitan area is no easy feat, and the engineering challenges themselves have been immense. When you see it up close and personal, it is an engineering marvel. It's almost like doing you know, open heart surgery in the middle of, of the CBD, digging an excavation down, and, you know, down about 50 metres below the CBD. That was to get below all of the services, get below the footings of the current um, high-rise office buildings and so forth. So it's actually the deepest hole ever dug in Brisbane. And uh, we're putting the station into that because the, the tunnels have to weave their way underneath the middle of the city. So the tunnel boring machines do what they had to do to get under the river. Uh, the rock is very hard. They just ate it up. The Albert Street station sits 31 metres below the heart of the city, and in such a densely packed area, every bit of space counts. That's where these mezzanines come in. They make use of these massive tunnels by creating a pedestrian level directly above the train tracks. Now, mezzanines aren't anything new, but the way these ones are being built is new with this segmental bridge technique. That's a pretty common practice for building bridges above ground, but constructing something like this in a tunnel underground is a whole new challenge. Here's how they're doing it. Each mezzanine beam is precast in massive concrete segments weighing up to 70 tonnes. They're then lowered down through this hole in the heart of the city into tunnels that will become the new train station. Because an underground station is a lot more cramped than a wide open space above ground, equipment was custom made to fit the site. Next, those three segments are connected into one single beam, which is picked up, rotated 90 degrees, and then placed onto the cavern arches to form the mezzanine level. This was all made possible thanks to the early integration of a digital twin of the entire project. It's essentially a virtual version of the Cross River Rail using software from Bentley. It was even first-person navigable, just like a video game. The model is so detailed that those on site can use it in real time, essentially as an x-ray, to see behind walls or what's behind them. It's also meant that other future projects in the city could access the model and plan around the new stations down to the millimeter. The digital twin has enabled engineering and construction decisions to be taken quickly and efficiently, reducing overall costs. Design flaws could be spotted and fixed before they even became a problem, while the progress of the entire project could be seen from every every angle as it happened. The model will be used to train future drivers, as well as to update members of the public and brief ministers and the Premier. Specialist needs and disability groups are also using the model to ensure accessibility. Once the project's constructed, the digital twin will be used by operation and maintenance service providers.
When we started out on doing our 3D modelling, which we see as one of the sort of things that we're very proud of, there was no single solution that was actually going to give us what we want. Bentley, project-wise, provided the common data environment, which is the platform that we're using now. And really, they've been able to help us adapt. And as we've evolved the project and the model, Bentley have been part of that journey with us. Cross River Rail is now well on its way to being delivered. Early works began back in August 2017 and major contractors commenced construction in late 2019. The project sets open in 2026, well ahead of the 2032 Olympic deadline. Using the Olympics as a means of, of a catalyst for that type of activity uh, you know, is, is a really positive thing. We need to be Olympics ready. The next decade is going to see phenomenal changes for Brisbane and South East Queensland. And when you look at projects like this, you realise those changes have already begun. Construction projects don't come much bigger than this. HS2 is a new high-speed railway being built right up the heart of Britain with the promise of economic growth, low-carbon travel, more capacity and some of the fastest trains on earth. High Speed 2 is one of the world's biggest infrastructure projects. It'll start right here in the heart of London and run across through and under England's countryside to the Midlands and one day beyond. But building it is far from easy. The project has gone several times over budget and faced delays and staunch opposition. It's now known more for its setbacks and the decisions of those in power than its benefits or the incredible engineering that's going on. An idea to bring a country closer together has become divisive. HS2 will generate jobs, skills and economic growth. It is just a waste of money, a terrible waste of taxpayers' money. And that's not just a UK issue, we're seeing this everywhere. When public money is involved, the stakes get much higher, the scrutiny gets more intense. And when things go wrong, it can become difficult or even impossible to stop. So how much say do we really have over the massive projects like High Speed 2 built with our money? Can our governments ever stop once they've started? And does there come a point with these projects where they're just no longer worth it? We can now travel over land at the rate of 30 miles an hour. Think of it, ladies and gentlemen. 30 miles an hour. Houston. Departure point for 175 trains every day. We need to build new railway lines in our country. We haven't built a line north of London for 120 years. It will redefine the way we travel around our country, I'm absolutely convinced. Finally giving the home of the railways the fast connections, they need another back. None of it makes any sense without HS2. The way that UK government makes decisions with ebb and flow depending on the political weather, that's not how you deliver major infrastructure. We're in a climate emergency. We need to be doing sustainable creation, not destroying the country. This project is absolute madness. In the whole size of HS2, the only thing to do is keep digging. HS2 will deliver lots of benefits. There's no question about that. The question is whether it's worth the costs. Like many countries, the UK is divided. There are big economic and social differences between the capital and the rest of the country, and there's little sign of anything changing. Back in 2009, the government proposed a new high-speed railway to better connect London and the north of England, spreading wealth up the country. Three years later, that project was approved and billions of taxpayer cash was set aside for it. It's called High Speed 2, which is often shortened to HS2, and it's being built in three stages. Phase 1 runs from London to Birmingham, Phase 2A will carry the route to a town called Crewe, and 2B takes it to Manchester and originally Leeds. High-speed trains would then continue on to other parts of the country at normal speeds, using the existing network, so those living in the wider north and Scotland can benefit too. The trains will have a top speed of 225 miles an hour, the fastest in Europe. Now, to do that, they need a track that's as straight and flat as possible, but drawing a straight flat line up England isn't easy. Some 90% of the Phase 1 route will be up on bridges and viaducts, or dug below ground in tunnels and cuttings. 
making it an immense feat of engineering. A journey north from London will begin here, in a new three-storey terminal at Euston. It'll have the UK's longest concourse, a prefabricated geometric roof, and 10 platforms built some 8 metres below ground. This site down here at Euston is where that massive new terminal is going to start to rise in the years to come. Now, it might not look like much right now, but just getting to this stage has been tough going, and the team has faced all the kind of challenges you might expect them to face when clearing a site like this in the heart of a major city. Existing buildings, neighbouring properties, traffic, services, and of course the current live railway running into Euston alongside them. After Euston, trains will arrive at Old Oak Common, where there'll be additional links to Heathrow Airport, Wales and the South West. The first landmark outside London is the Colne Valley Viaduct. It'll run for 3.4 kilometres across several waterways and become the country's longest railway crossing. Next up is the 16-kilometre Chiltern Tunnel, the longest and deepest on the entire route, sitting up to 90 metres underground. Then it's another tunnel, but this one is less about length and depth and more about what's above it. The UK has over 300,000 hectares of ancient woodland. That's trees that have been around since 1600. Despite weathering the ages, some of those trees now find themselves in the path of HS2. Instead of cutting them all down, planners have tried to limit their destruction, and one way is to go underneath them, like up here at Long Itchington Wood. This is one of HS2's new tunnels, and just behind me back there is where construction teams are working a way to dig this route deep beneath England's countryside. Now, when you're down here, you can't help but be blown away by the scale of the engineering that's going into this project. In years to come, people on trains are going to pass through here in a matter of seconds. They'll be drinking a coffee, doing some emails, and they probably won't even notice. But to make that leisurely experience possible, construction teams are putting in the grind, using 2,000 tonne tunnel boring machines like this to cut a path. The machines feature a cutting head at the front and a system that quickly takes soil back up to the surface in these pipes along the sides of the tunnel. This is the very front of one of HS2's tunnel boring machines. Just ahead of me up there is a massive cutting head that's steadily eating its way through the soil by about 20 to 24 metres a day. Slowly but surely, this machine is building part of HS2. The Long Itchington Tunnel will run for 1.6 kilometres and be the first to complete across the whole route when it finishes in 2023. It's just one example of some of the massive feats of engineering that are taking place between London and the Midlands to enable this high-speed line to run. In time, those incredibly fast trains are going to run across the ground I'm currently standing on, through this cutting and on towards Birmingham. The last stop before Birmingham is the Solihull Interchange, currently billed as the world's most eco-friendly railway station, with connections to the airport and the exhibition centre. Phase 1 then all culminates at Birmingham Curzon Street. It's the first intercity rail terminus built in the UK since the 1800s, and it'll feature an arched roof inspired by the railway pioneers of that era. It's all a lot of work and money to connect London and the Midlands, but there's a payoff. Economic growth. The idea is that the billions being poured into this project will be paid back, and that millions of people will have their quality of life improved. High-speed rail effectively brings major cities and population centres closer together. Businesses can access larger customer bases, supply chains and labour pools. Integration and trade are improved, productivity goes up, and commuting longer distances becomes possible. You no longer have to buy a house in an expensive region in order to work there, and that takes pressure off the housing crisis. HS2 will slash journey times. Getting from London to Birmingham will take just 45 minutes, 37 minutes quicker than today. But better connectivity between regions is about more than just speed. There's another key word in all this. Capacity. If you take a look at the UK's rail map, you might question whether this project makes any sense. London already has a direct connection to Birmingham and Manchester via the West Coast Main Line, so why build another? Well, because it's one of the busiest railways in Europe. It's used by intercity, local and freight trains all at the same time, and things can get crowded. HS2 will be just for high-speed passenger trains. It'll mean getting up and down the country quicker, and free up much-needed space on the existing lines. The hope is that this all makes taking the train an obvious choice, as compared to driving or catching a domestic flight. 
It's designed to be the world's most sustainable high-speed railway, offering carbon-free travel from the day the trains start running. It all seems like a good idea, but there are some who question whether the UK actually needs this high-speed line at all. Unlike some other countries renowned for their high-speed rail networks, the UK's major cities are all much closer together. That's a factor that's perpetuated the lack of an extensive high-speed network in the UK to date, and one reason why it hasn't cultivated much homegrown talent or expertise good at building it. The guy tasked with assembling and leading the team that's having a go for the first time in decades is Mark Thurston. Major 2 is a once-in-a-generation project. We will connect all the major cities on that corridor uh, in our country at high speed, clearly make a massive difference to the way we decarbonise our transport system. I mean, it is unprecedented. Over 300 sites alone just between here and the West Midlands. But also, again, if you look around us here in Euston, we're right on top of the local community. So how do we build this railway sensitively in a way that respects people have got to kill their lives you know, for some years yet well, until this railway is fully commissioned? Now, you might be wondering who gets the say over whether or not big, expensive projects that impact so many people's lives like this get to happen. Well, it's complicated, but stick with us, because grasping this will help you better understand how your tax money is being spent. The UK is a constitutional monarchy. The sovereign is in charge, but delegates all their power to a democratically elected government and lower house of parliament called the House of Commons. Like many countries, we elect people from each region to sit on that parliament and represent us. The political party that wins the most seats forms the government. They get to control all the government departments and decide which laws are introduced and debated in the House of Commons. They pretty much set the agenda. Now, we decide which candidate or party we're going to vote for based on what they say they're going to do. And in the UK, the two major parties, the Conservatives and Labour, both advocate the principle of a new high-speed rail line. So, in a way, the people chose this. The elected UK government formally decided to build HS2 back in 2012. After a lot of debate and consultation, finally in 2017, Parliament overwhelmingly passed a bill giving the government special powers to build, operate and maintain Phase 1. When Boris Johnson then became Prime Minister in 2019, he commissioned the Okavy Review to advise his government on whether and how to proceed with the project. Then he made the final call. The Cabinet has given High Speed Rail the green signal. We are, we are going to get this done. At that point, with powers already obtained from Parliament back in 2017, Boris signed the final notice to proceed with the project. Permission for Phase 2A followed in 2021. To try and get a better understanding of this complicated process and how it's used to approve projects like HS2, I went to see Stephen Glaister. He's Emeritus Professor of Transport and Infrastructure at Imperial College London, and he was a contributor to that Okavy review. The parliamentary process, of course, is very important with a big scheme like this. You can't build a railway in this country without parliamentary approval. The government has made a decision in principle to build this scheme, so it's a matter of policy, to build the whole scheme. The parliamentary process is to allow people who are badly affected to make their case about how their interests should be um, dealt with. In 2012, when the project was first backed, it was given a target finish date of 2026 for Phase 1, and 2033 for Phase 2. The initial budget was set at £32.7 billion. That's a lot of cash. It gets funded by something called a grant in aid from the government, which in turn gets its money from the taxpaying public, people like me and you. Small amounts gathered from millions of us can create a hefty budget, and that's what puts most national infrastructure projects in a completely different budget galaxy to skyscrapers, or other buildings funded by private companies or people. Even tech giants like Google, Facebook or Apple don't spend more than a few single-digit billions on their flagship projects, and they're some of the richest firms in the world. Now, you'd think that combining such a big budget with the UK's history as the birthplace of the railways would be a winning formula, but HS2 hasn't gone to plan, and public opinion now is generally far from positive. Data from May 2022 shows that only 7% of Brits strongly support HS2, compared to 19% that strongly oppose it. 
So what happened between the original business case when people were sold HS2 and all those benefits made it feel like a bit of a no-brainer, and today? Well, the short answer is that the ambitious dream of redefining how people travel has begun to clash hard with the realities of making it happen. Many are unhappy with the choice of route. Residents and businesses have had to be moved out of the way. Thousands of people have been served with compulsory purchase notices, and others have seen their properties plummet in value. These initial works mark the start of years of heavy construction and a crash in the value of property nearby. Sadly, this is often the trade-off when building infrastructure. To benefit millions, a minority are asked to pay a heavy price. Building a project like this, on a route like this, inevitably means you're going to have to make some tough decisions at some point on the way around what has to move out of the way. Yeah, I mean, if you look at what we're doing here, just at Euston alone, you know, we're on top of the local community, a live railway station just behind us, uh, massive demolitions in the background here just to sort of clear the footprint for the station. So to your point, those tough decisions are made, you could point to multiple examples of them all along the route. However, some property owners feel they've been offered unfair valuations and have criticised how they were dealt with. But perhaps the biggest source of contention has been the project's environmental impact. Even with sections like the Long Itchington Tunnel, which aim to protect ancient woodland as much as possible, around 24 hectares will be lost on Phase 1 across 25 sites. That's around 34 football pitches. HS2 say this only amounts to the partial destruction of these habitats, and they're planting millions of new trees in return that they are responsible for maintaining. When you put point-to-point know, -point city high-speed connections in place, that has the economic effect, but to do that, we've had to be really sensitive about the impact on the natural environment. We've got a target to plant some 7 million bushes and trees along the route. We're always, we're getting close to north of 700,000 already. We're very sensitive to and it's sympathetic to, to that natural environment. Now, you could argue that people and businesses might, in time, adapt and move on from a difficult compulsory purchase of their land. But trees that have been around since the time of Elizabeth I aren't coming back anytime soon, and that's tough for some to swallow. The anger has boiled over into numerous protests, from sites way out in the country to the heart of the capital. In a park in front of Euston Station, some people who want HS2 stopped have set up a protest camp. There are 80,000 people here and they all walk through the open countryside here. Um, HS2 is a concrete electrified scar that will cut them off from their access to countryside. Many also believe the project poses a huge threat to animals and other plant life, even though efforts are being made to protect species like endangered bats, and the scheme is projected to leave behind 30% more wildlife habitats than exist currently. HS2 claims it's been employing more stringent environmental standards than in many other countries building high-speed tracks. And right there, you have one of the reasons why this project, which was already priority to begin with, is now set to become the most expensive high-speed railway in the world. That 32 billion figure from earlier was only the initial budget from 2012. After just one year, the estimate had risen to 42.6 billion. It then went up to 55.7 billion in 2015, and that's the number that Parliament passed the bill on in 2017. Two years later, HS2 put the cost at around 88 billion, while in 2020, the Okavy Review found the bill could go as high as 106 billion. Today, the government puts the cost somewhere between 72 and 98 billion pounds. And with billions more in what's called future cost pressures now being reported, that number isn't final. The current global inflation and supply chain challenges could all start to have an impact too. 44.6 billion is now going on phase one alone, more than the entire project was supposed to cost at first. And almost 15 billion pounds of that has already been spent. We asked HS2 for comment on these budget issues, and they responded that the project remains within budget, meaning the latest budget that's been set. They added that the original budget was worked out using simple calculations and 2011 rates that didn't take the scheme's full complexities into account. Whatever your take on this, the cost now is a lot more than what was in the budget when Parliament chose to approve it. Would our elected MPs have made a different decision if they knew how much it would eventually cost? 
Parliament was asked to make a decision in principle, but they were offered a set of costs which were much less than the outturn costs. Had they been offered at a cost of 100 billion, they might have come to a different answer on behalf of us all. The project's been hit by delays too. Phase one was supposed to finish in 2026, but now it's 2029 at the earliest. As for the entire network, which was meant to wrap up by 2033, it could now be as late as 2041. 2B hasn't cleared Parliament yet, so exact details of what it will look like and where it will go remain uncertain. A bit of a case of 2B or not 2B. Along the route, there have been some unexpected complications which have had pretty dramatic consequences. In 2019, ground conditions had become, in the words of HS2's then chairman, significantly more challenging than predicted. He revealed that the 2015 cost estimate for Phase 1 was made without the benefit of any investigation of ground conditions or similar levels of detail across all areas of scope. More time has been needed for ground settlements, adding to the delays, and there have had to be route changes further north to avoid obstacles like salt mines. It's also been revealed that the cost of buying up property for Phase 1 is over three times more than first thought, at around £3.9 billion. That's according to figures provided to us by HS2. They added that every home, business and piece of land is unique, and there are sometimes different opinions between owners, their professional advisors and HS2 about the value of a property. In all cases, we seek a fair deal for both claimants and the taxpayer. There have been delays to the stations too, including here at Euston. The latest designs were only revealed in March 2022, seven years after the first images were made public, and after construction here had already begun. And yet, there's more. One major decision has sparked anger and disappointment in the region that was supposed to benefit most from this project. London's one of the world's top financial centres, with a higher GDP across its metropolitan area than anywhere else in Europe, and a habit of spending big on infrastructure. But many other parts of the UK, like here in Leeds, haven't seen the same levels of infrastructure and public services investment creating a north-south divide that's only getting bigger. The north of England has long suffered with outdated transport systems, while the capital continues to get more big projects like the Elizabeth Line. One of the current UK government's big pledges at the last election was to level up the whole country. Now, that involves boosting local economies outside London, and building a high-speed train line to them would be a good start. To try and really understand the north-south divide and what a high-speed railway could do for this part of the country, I caught up with Henry Merrison from the Northern Powerhouse Partnership. It's an independent body that represents businesses and civic leaders across the north. How much of a north-south divide is there in the UK and is it getting better or worse in your view? So our analysis of the most recent ONS data, which is collected for all the regions of the UK, shows that London has really bounced back. Uh, and the challenge is that the rest of the country is still lagging behind. And in reality, under this current government, we're not making huge progress. It may take longer to see some of the benefits of some of the levelling up projects, but they're often too short term, not focused enough on long term productivity, and so unlikely to yield the longer term benefits we need economically. But this is exactly the kind of issue that HS2 was designed to fix. So now the people of the North can look forward to phase 2B being completed and all the economic advantages it's going to bring. Then there's Northern Powerhouse Rail, another major programme of upgrades which would link with HS2 as part of a new integrated rail plan for the region. Sounds like things are looking up at last. But there's a big problem. When those costs were getting out of hand and it was decided that part of the route had to be shelved, it was the bit that runs right here to Leeds that took the hit. That route we showed earlier, going all the way up to Leeds, is no longer happening, and that Northern Powerhouse Rail Scheme has also been downgraded. The eastern leg of Phase 2B will now terminate near Nottingham, over 70 miles away. Trains will still be able to go further north, but only on existing non-high-speed lines. Although the intention is to get to Leeds eventually, and ideas have been put forward, nothing's been confirmed. There's just a study, which in itself is set to cost a further £100 million. The original plan, which was to deliver HS2 in full and Northern Powerhouse Rail from here through Bradford across to Manchester, is now not being delivered. So losing both with no certainty exactly over what will replace it, there's a, a notional promise from government 
of some HS2 trains coming to Leeds, well, we don't know how frequent or what the capacity will be, so we don't really know the value of that. So we are talking to the government now about uh, the eastern leg, certainly having travelled in around the Midlands and the north a lot on rail, you see the stark difference between the sort of frequency and regularity of services compared to London and South East. So that's, I think, where we need to sort of put our focus next, working with the Department for Transport. But that's not all of it. The project is still being scaled back, and again, it's the north that's affected. Even while we were making this film, another key section connecting to the West Coast Main Line was cut. It was through here that high-speed trains would have continued on as far as Scotland. The government says it's now committed to finding the best solution to take HS2 trains to Scotland, and will explore alternatives that deliver similar benefits. There's issues to iron out in Manchester as well, like the decision to build the main station on the surface rather than underground, which has been criticised by some local officials. Currently, a journey from London to Leeds in the UK looks like this. Now, this trip is taking me two hours and 13 minutes. Under the original plans for HS2, that would have been dramatically cut to just one hour and 21 minutes. But when phase one completes, the difference will be just 20 minutes. From what we were promised with HS2, that original dream, this, this fantastic railway connecting all parts of the UK, or certainly the North, has, has public opinion shifted now? I think that the public opinion uh, it's wary of a government that isn't prepared to keep its promises to the north of England. In this country, we are entirely dependent on who the occupants of number 10 and 11 are for whether Leeds gets a mass transit system or whether Leeds gets its HS2 station or whether Leeds gets access to a train line that's supposedly for its own benefit. Now, that doesn't mean the north isn't getting anything at all. Billions have been spent to upgrade transport links across this region through that new integrated rail plan. But for many people up here, that doesn't make up for the loss of high-speed rail, which they were promised by the government. The integrated rail plan represented 36 billion of cuts to what had originally been promised. And that, rather than just being an economic problem, it's also a political problem for a government that claims it's levelling up. If you had to describe HS2 in a single word, what would that word be? A start. Uh, and a, a pro the problem is that I don't think this government intends to finish it. To their credit, those currently working for HS2 are doing their best to move on from the past and politics and just focus on constructing the railway. But despite the good job that teams on the front line are doing, it's clear that what's currently being built is a long way from what was put forward at the beginning, and there's little sign of this project ever being stopped. So is it time for a radical rethink, or does this railway now simply have to be finished, no matter the cost? HS2 might have gone from an ambitious dream to a bit of a nightmare, but the UK is far from the only country to have had a few difficulties when it comes to building new infrastructure. In fact, many other public funded railways have also fallen behind schedule and gone over budget. California High Speed Rail in the US and Stuttgart 21 in Germany are just two examples. Big energy projects don't seem to fare much better either. The Oikoloto 3 power plant in Finland and China's Three Gorges Dam both faced big challenges. But it's not just the setbacks that feel repetitive. Infrastructure schemes like these all seem to fall back on the same vague, positive-sounding and almost unquestionable counter-argument to their problems. The promise of long-term economic gain. The almost counter-Trump cards to all the delay, the controversy, is this, this card of economic gain, economic growth. And actually this is going to be, it's painful now, but it's going to be worth it in the long run. Don't worry. Where's the line? How many more billions, how many more cost uplifts, how many more unexpected events before we say, actually, you know what, this just isn't worth it anymore. It's just too much hassle and we're never going to see the benefits. Or are we locked into this now, whatever it takes? There's no mechanistic way of deciding whether or not something's worthwhile or not. At the end of the day, it is of course a decision for government on behalf of the nation. People do not understand what this is going to cost the taxpayer. If you take 100 billion and divide that by the population of the country, it, it turns out to be um, over a thousand pounds per head. Um, bearing in mind that HS2 will be of use, direct value, to um, rather a small proportion of the population. So there's a real issue there. Another way of looking at that is £100 million a week, every week, for 20 years. Are there days where you question whether or not the whole thing's worth it? Uh, no, not really. Not really. I mean, you've, you've got to believe 
uh, in a project like this to do my job and, and all the people that work with me, you've got to believe it's an important project. So of course, as you say, there are swings and roundabouts and, and all big projects have sort of dark moments. But you, 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 the highs more than outweigh the lows. Do we have to just keep going and see it through? Or is there a line where we're just spending too much money and taking too much time for not enough economic gain? Well, I think ultimately that's a big question for the politicians. But, but let's be really clear. One of the things we did in my first sort of 18 months is reset the budget for phase one. I inherited both the budget and the time frame, which proved to be undeliverable. You know, but taxpayers generally can and should have confidence that we've set ourselves up now to deliver the project for the budgets we've committed to government. When done properly, the payoff of big public projects can be huge. They have the ability to shape our world and change its course. Better connectivity between countries, cleaner, more affordable energy, lifting people out of poverty, limiting the impact of natural disasters, it's all made possible by infrastructure projects. That's why so many national governments look to schemes like this and approve them despite their financial, social and environmental costs. Infrastructure has the potential to make a big lasting impact and enable countless other aspects of our societies, all with the added benefit of creating something very tangible and quite literally concrete to show voters. But the bigger the rewards, the bigger the risks and the costs. The stakes all round get much higher and everything becomes magnified. Yes, things go wrong in other parts of construction. We've seen unfinished skyscrapers, which usually happens when private developers run out of cash. But when it's public money that's on the line, that word unfinished becomes unthinkable. I do think that there's a problem in the British system, and maybe in other countries too, where, whereby governments get committed to um, a controversial idea. And because it's controversial, they make firm promises. And then if it turns out on further investigation not to be such a good idea, they defend the idea rather than being able to, to review it. I've said many times this, this project divides opinion. Uh, you know, it draws a huge amount of public money, it's disruptive, it takes a long time, uh, and, and people struggle sometimes to justify the, the investment in it. But of course, those railways that invested in high-speed rail have never regretted it. Britain's High Speed 2 is a potent reminder of the power of infrastructure. It shows us once again what the construction industry can do and the impact it can have on so much of our lives. The teams pulling off the extraordinary feats of engineering to create this railway are quite literally writing this country's next chapter into its land. For whatever the mistakes of this project's management or the discourse around its very existence, that's something that can't be taken away from these amazing people and it'll inspire future generations of engineers. And yet, around the world, the impact of what teams like this do places them in a firestorm of debate. Infrastructure schemes almost always face an uphill battle to deliver on their pledges and restore faith with the people they'll serve. We might be the ones coughing up the cash, but we're not calling the shots. While governments can be voted out, once projects like this get going and the train has left the station, there can be no going back. HS2 epitomises the story of the infrastructure megaproject. Huge benefits are laid out for future generations that citizens of today must bear the cost of, just as our predecessors did for us. The promise of a bigger prize ahead is used to counter painful issues and becomes the lens we see them through. Fear of stopping drives people on. Supporters and detractors are selective with their facts. We're told that we'll one day forget it all and only experience the benefits, but that verdict is cruelly deferred by decades. Only time will reveal the true extent of HS2's success and whether the decision to carry on was really worth it. But like so many infrastructure projects around the world, it will undoubtedly leave its mark on this nation. It's not the first massive scheme in history to daunt people with its costs, challenges and ambition. And it won't be the last. It, it will redefine the economic geography of our country. It will transform the way we think about low carbon travel in our country. Uh, and I think, frankly, certainly if you're based in the Midlands and you live in the Midlands and the North, you, you won't realise the true effects it'll have until it's, until it's open. Like so many of the world's biggest infrastructure projects, Britain's High Speed 2 promises enormous benefits, requires huge amounts of money, is grappling with immense challenges, 
and contains enough nuance and trade-off to sharply divide opinion. But for whatever you may think of this and other big public projects like it, it's kind of time that more of us sat up and took notice of the extraordinary influence the construction sector has on all of our lives and the massive projects being built with our money and in our names. This high-speed train's arriving in Nanjing after its 190 mile per hour journey across China. On board are people going to work or seeing friends in the city. They're passengers making use of what's now the biggest high-speed rail network anywhere in the world. But that statement doesn't really come anywhere near close to explaining what this actually is. Two-thirds of the world's entire high-speed rail network is now in China. In the 12 years since its first line opened, the country has dramatically outbuilt every other nation and now plans to double the size of its high-speed network in just the next 15 years. Travel times have fallen, the country's economy has boomed, cities have exploded, and the rest of the world's been left wondering how they'll ever come close to building at such an insatiable pace. This is the unstoppable high-speed growth of China's high-speed rail network explained. There are high-speed rail networks around the world, but then there's the network in China. It's an insanely large web of track that's helped to ignite an economic powerhouse. In little over a decade, the country's built enough high-speed lines to almost circle the globe, and the system welcomed 1.7 billion passengers in 2019 alone. To put that into context, the UK built a high-speed rail line between London and the Channel Tunnel in the 2000s that's equivalent to 0.2% of China's current network. The new HS2 line was first proposed in 2009, and phase one of it is due to complete in 2033. The US has one high-speed line in the northeast, but it's arguably not actually high-speed, and California's new line won't open before 2029. Of course, the approach to high-speed rail in these countries is very different, and we'll come back to that a little later on. To properly understand how this jaw-dropping network came to be and where it's headed, you need to look at the story of modern China. Since the 1980s, the country has roughly doubled its GDP every eight years. More than 800 million people have been lifted out of poverty, and between the year 2000 and 2018, over 47% of the population has risen to middle-class status. Cities few had heard of 20 years ago are now vast metropolises. Across the country, skyscrapers soar above your head, factories teem with activity, and trade booms. This isn't all down to high-speed rail. The fast lines have played a huge role in accelerating the country's growth since 2008, but before that, train systems were under pressure. Faced with buckling infrastructure, state planning for high-speed rail began in 1990, and the first line between Beijing and Tianjin opened in 2008, cutting travel between the two cities from 70 minutes to 30. Other lines were quickly introduced, linking the cities of Shanghai, Wuhan, Chengdu, and more. Initial trains were imported or built under technology transfer agreements with foreign train makers. But since then, Chinese engineers have become leaders in the field. The country now has the world's longest high-speed rail line between Beijing and Guangzhou, the world's fastest high-speed line between Beijing and Shanghai, and the world's first commercial maglev line reaching a top speed of 267 miles an hour. As of 2021, China's high-speed rail network stretches for 37,900 kilometers, while its entire rail track length runs for over 141,000 kilometers. By 2035, the high-speed network will have grown to 70,000 kilometers, and the total rail length will extend over 200,000 kilometers. China's case for high-speed rail continues to strengthen. The lines it's built have drastically shortened journey times, improved safety, reduced carbon emissions, 
and allowed many Chinese people from rural or less developed areas to access the country's massive cities. Studies have also found that tourism increases by around 20% in provinces connected to the high-speed network. The plans for expansion are intended to build on this success, but also to address the country's wealth discrepancy problem. The rich coastal region cities of Beijing and Shanghai have a far higher nominal per capita income, sometimes more than double or quadruple that of those living inland. Beijing hopes new lines will grow more regional hubs. By 2035, all cities with a population of more than 200,000 will be connected by rail, and those with more than half a million people will have access to high-speed rail. The strategy also helps Beijing with its desire to unify the country. A standard rail line was built from Beijing to Tibet despite its small population, while a high-speed line links the capital directly with Hong Kong, a special administrative region. In the central government's own words, the high-speed line to the northwestern Zhenjing province, native home to the Uyghurs, was partly built to promote what it calls ethnic unity. So how has China built such a massive high-speed rail network, while other countries have been left standing? The first reason is demand. The US has eight cities with more than five million people. India has seven, Japan has three, the UK just one. China has 14. The Shanghai-Beijing line alone serves more than 300 million people. This unprecedented rate of urbanization combined with rising household incomes creates a need for the fast delivery of people and goods across the country. At the same time, China's heavily congested airspace often causes flight delays, and high-speed rail is not only cheaper, but also hugely more reliable. The high levels of demand allow the Chinese government to make massive investments in high-speed technology and infrastructure. The sheer scale of the country's ambition, combined with a credible plan to build such a big network, and the fact that nearly all of China's rail is controlled by the state-owned China Railway Corporation means that high volumes of materials can be ordered and produced at once. The country's also standardized nearly every aspect of construction. Embankments, track, viaducts, electrification and communication systems are all the same, no matter where you are in the country. This lowers construction costs, enables off-site manufacturing and cuts build times. In Europe, High-speed rail costs around 25 to 39 million US dollars per kilometer, while in the US it's around 56 million dollars per kilometer. In China, it's down at 17 million dollars, up to two-thirds lower than other countries. Of course, there's a few things that bring the cost of building down. In 2021, more than 40% of China's population, around 600 million people, still live on less than five dollars a day, and labor costs are low. Land acquisition is also easier than elsewhere, partly due to the country's geography and political system. The process of moving people out of the way of a new line in the US accounts for around 20% of the project cost. In China, that's less than 8%. The country's also kept high-speed rail fares low for the average person. Tickets are a quarter of the cost of other nations. Interestingly, this often means foregoing making any profit on the lines constructed. Instead, China sees the social and wider economic impact of its high-speed network as more valuable. As he took office in February 2021, US Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg said he'd like to see America lead the world in high-speed rail. While it may be possible to set the country on a course towards that during his term, the chances of the US overtaking China by building 70,000 and one kilometers of track in the next two decades feels remote. Though high-speed rail may seem out of reach to many, the current economic crisis could be an opportunity. In 2008, China responded to the global financial crisis by investing heavily in high-speed infrastructure, stimulating its economy and creating jobs. Today, that network is the lifeblood of this huge, ambitious, beautiful and complex country.
This is a Japanese bullet train. If you want to get somewhere in this country fast, then it's got you covered. An engineering marvel formed in the aftermath of the Second World War, it's carried more than 10 billion passengers at speeds of up to 320 kilometers an hour and helped create the world's third largest economy. But that's not enough for Japan, and the country is now building the world's fastest passenger train, a system that'll move at twice the speed of the bullet trains and cut journey times in half, all by doing away with one fairly fundamental component, wheels. Using magnetic levitation, these new trains will hover 10 centimeters above the track, eliminating the friction that comes with being in contact with the rails. But the new line has proved deeply controversial, grappling with delays, skyrocketing construction costs, and a fierce debate over environmental concerns. Now nearing completion, the world is awaiting to see whether the project will successfully hover above its challenges and make a quantum leap for transportation, or prove a step too far. Japan kind of knows a thing or two about trains. The country was the first in the world to develop high-speed rail with the construction of the Tokaido Shinkansen line between Tokyo and Osaka in 1959. Back then, the Japanese people and indeed the rest of the world were skeptical of the country's massive investment into rail, and many thought it would soon be outdated in an exciting new era of air travel and highways. Nevertheless, the first high-speed line opened in October 1964, ready for Tokyo's first hosting of the Olympics. It cut the travel time between Japan's two biggest cities from nearly seven hours to just under four. Proving an instant success, the line served more than 100 million passengers in less than three years. That same trip on a modern bullet train now takes two and a half hours. When the new Chaoshing Canton line opens, it'll be done in just 67 minutes. At full speed, the Chaoshing Canton trains will move at 500 kilometers an hour, although a 2015 test run hit a world record 603 kilometers an hour. Now, it's pretty widely agreed that those kind of speeds are basically impossible for a conventional bullet train to hit. They eventually will become limited by the friction that's created by their wheels. To solve that problem, Japanese engineers looked back in time to a technology that's actually been around since the early 1900s. Magnetic levitation, also known as maglev. In fact, concepts for maglev trains date back to the 60s, and the world's first and so far only commercial maglev line has been in operation since 2004, running between Shanghai's city center and its airport. The Central Japan Railway Company, or JR Central, has modernized this technology using superconducting magnets. Electromagnets are cooled to minus 269 degrees, allowing the trains to levitate higher above the tracks. But the trains need to be moving at speed before the magnets come in. Once the train reaches 150 km an hour by itself, maglev kicks in and the carriage is lifted off its rubber wheels. The train then interacts with a set of coils in the track, one used to levitate its mass and the other to propel it forward. Now, without the wheels, the carriages can travel at incredible speeds. The trains are also completely autonomous, controlled by the track rather than a driver, a measure which, it's claimed, makes collisions or accidents far less likely. The Tokyo to Nagoya line has been under construction since 2014 and is expected to open in 2027. A further extension linking Tokyo to Osaka will begin to be built straight afterwards and open as early as 2037, 10 years ahead of schedule. Unlike the existing bullet trains whose tracks hug the Japanese coastline, Chaoshing Kansen will be 90% underground, cutting beneath the Southern Alps. 256 kilometers of the 285 kilometer long line will be in tunnels. The reasons for this are twofold. Firstly, maglev trains work better when they travel in the straightest line possible, and burrowing beneath the mountains avoids Japan's more earthquake-prone coast. Although in taking this approach, JR Central has ended up digging some of the deepest tunnels Japan has ever seen. 
That's raised a number of environmental concerns, especially in the Shizuoka prefecture, where tunneling threatens the basin of the Oi River, a major water source for the region. While environmental studies have found that the risk of disturbing the basin is low, local governments have criticised those reports for being, in their words, insufficient and hasty. The incumbent governor of Shizuoka even ran on a platform opposing the railway, successfully winning an election in June 2021 where Chaoshin Kansen was a key issue. This controversy, combined with unexpected hurdles in the construction of new stations, has taken the project's cost from $13.7 billion to a staggering $64 billion, making it one of the most expensive megaprojects ever undertaken in the country. The hefty price tags now leading many in Japan to question whether the new line is worth it at all. Indeed, there are quite a few drawbacks to Japan's maglev. Once completed, it'll be more expensive to run than regular high-speed trains because it consumes more energy, though you could argue that it will enable greater economic growth. The trains also won't be able to hold as many passengers within their smaller carriages, and they won't travel as frequently. Traditional bullet trains run on the Tokyo Osaka line roughly every three minutes. Because maglev track switches take more time, it'll only be possible to run a maglev train once every 10 minutes. Japanese rail companies have also previously been able to make a lot of money by selling their technology overseas. But a noticeable new player has emerged on the scene since the advent of the first bullet train back in 1964. China It's now the king of high-speed rail and the country's home to two-thirds of the world's entire high-speed network. While none of its intercity lines are maglev, China is beginning to develop its own version of the technology. In July 2021, it tested a maglev train that reached 600 km an hour, almost breaking the record set by Japan. That train could theoretically go from Beijing to Shanghai in three and a half hours, faster than the four and a half hours it takes by plane. China doesn't need to buy Japan's technology, and the rest of the world is still playing catch up with regular high-speed rail. So why is Japan so intent on building this maglev line, and why did the government grant JR Central a loan to finish it 10 years ahead of schedule? If Chaoshin Kansen is successful, then it has the potential to create a commutable distance between the country's two largest cities, linking the regions of Tokyo and Osaka in a pretty profound way. It's a prize that's becoming increasingly alluring around the world. Megacities are systematically being made of China's Pearl River Delta through strategically placed infrastructure, while less formally the boundaries between cities in the northeastern United States, from Washington DC up to Boston, are being blurred. It's the same in Western Europe. Merging major cities like this has the potential to create economic powerhouses on a scale we've never seen before. When the bullet train first began construction more than half a century ago, the world ridiculed it. But it ultimately allowed Japan to grow, connecting regions and sharing prosperity. In the decade that followed its opening, Japan went from an economy that was just 10% the size of the US to the world's second largest. Of course, we'll need to wait and see if this new line can levitate the country to further success. But moving people between major cities in record-breaking time would open up a whole new world. Say you want to travel across Europe, or China, Japan, India, even parts of the US. You could take a train if you wanted to. But in Africa, a large-scale train network doesn't really exist. And for the fastest urbanizing area on the planet, that's a problem. To fill this pretty critical infrastructure gap, Africa is undergoing a railway renaissance. And it's being built in large part by China. $10.8 billion Chinese built railway is meant to supplement the current line built by British colonialists. These mega projects are more than just impressive feats of engineering passing through safari camps and the East African desert. They're symbols of better connected societies, economic opportunity, international alliances, soft power, and a shifting balance in the world of construction. 
to really understand why China is building railways in Africa, you have to rewind a bit. We could go way back, but let's start here. The Bangdoon Conference in 1955. Leaders from 29 Asian and African nations met in the hopes of working together in the wake of Western colonialism. From that international solidarity came the Tazara Railway, which opened in 1975. The railroad was financed and mostly built by China, and it provided the landlocked country of Zambia with a 1,860 kilometers link to Tanzania and a way to export its copper to global market without crossing white minority ruled uh, territories. Since then, Chinese investment in Africa has exploded from about 75 million US dollars in 2003 to roughly 2.7 billion in 2019. Now, more than 30% of China's investment in Africa is in the construction sector. China has become the most important source of development finance in Africa. In the past, we talked about railroad imperialism, but now nobody is really investing as much as China in this railroad connectivity. China's built a massive high-speed rail network in a matter of years, and it's now bringing that expertise to Africa. Two of its biggest investments in East Africa are the Addis Ababa Djibouti Railway and the Kenya Standard Gauge Railway. The $4 billion Chinese built line across Ethiopia stretches 756 kilometers from the landlocked capital of Addis Ababa to the port of Djibouti. With commercial operations beginning in 2018, it's now the backbone of the Ethiopian National Railway Network. Construction involved modernizing an old, deteriorated meter gauge railway by upgrading it to the Chinese electrified railway standard, making it the first of its kind in East Africa. The locomotives are supplied by Chinese contractors and are built to withstand altitude differences of up to 2,000 meters, daytime temperatures of up to 50 degrees Celsius, and cold nights. One promise of the railway was to provide convenient air-conditioned travel. Passenger volumes haven't been as high as expected, with only 84,000 people travelling in 2019, and the service isn't always reliable. But a big part of the railway's long-term potential is in freight transport. More than 90% of Ethiopia's international trade passes through Djibouti, and the new line carries roughly a quarter of all Ethiopian imports and exports. Still, freight volumes haven't come close to reaching their full capacity yet, and unsurprisingly, the railway is struggling to turn a profit. 70% of the project was funded using loans from China's state-owned Exim Bank. And in 2019, both passenger and cargo combined only brought in $40 million, well below the $70 million cost of actually operating the line. The problem is like if you don't have freight or passengers that go through the railroad, then of course you cannot generate enough income to repay the loans. And so this is kind of a, a vicious circle. Over in Kenya, the Standard Gauge Railway opened in 2017. With a route length of 480 kilometers, the $3.8 billion high-speed railway is Kenya's largest infrastructure project since it gained independence in 1963. Construction, led by China Road and Bridge Corporation, involved building long viaducts, deep cuttings, and long embankments to navigate the rugged terrain along the route. As you might expect, building a project of this scale through the stunning natural habitats that Kenya is known for has proven to be a difficult balancing act. Two sections of the railroad running through national parks faced protests from conservationists over concerns that it could threaten the wildlife. In response, designers added 14 wildlife channels and elevated sections of the track. Now complete, the railway is a game changer for both trade and transportation in the region. The passenger service has cut travel time from Mombasa to Nairobi from more than 10 hours to roughly 5 hours with a $10 economy ticket. In its second year of service, the Kenyan Railway transported 1.7 million passengers, 
and the freight service ferried roughly 5 million tons of goods on Chinese-supplied locomotives. China's approach to infrastructure development is attractive for African countries because China isn't just providing the finance, it's also this kind of one-stop shop that can supply everything for the life cycle of a project. When dealing with China, things are simple. You don't have to balance multiple actors' interests or take them into consideration. But once again, things have gotten messy when it comes to money. China's Exim Bank financed 90% of the projects and now Kenya is struggling to pay back its loans. And because both of these railways are built to a Chinese standard, any major upgrades or even parts that need to be replaced will have to come from China. China's investments in foreign infrastructure goes way beyond these railways. Around the world, it's financing and constructing hundreds of infrastructure projects through its massive Belt and Road Initiative. Based on their own development experience, the Chinese are believers in the power of infrastructure and its ability to catalyze economic activity. Engaging with partners that have this appetite for infrastructure development works for Africa. In Africa alone, China is estimated to have won almost half of all engineering procurement and construction contracts. But those contracts haven't come without controversy. The country has been accused of unfair labour practices in Africa, including bringing in its own workers instead of hiring locally. Some studies have shown that Chinese firms actually do hire large numbers of local employees, but the top management positions are still dominated by Chinese staff. The construction of the Ethiopian railway employed roughly 20,000 local workers in Ethiopia and 5,000 in Djibouti. There's no African standard for building railways, so trying to link up colonial-era tracks with newer Chinese standard lines is a massive undertaking. That's all to say that China's involvement in African infrastructure is a complicated, nuanced investment. But relying so heavily on a single country to finance your development is a risky bet. You have Africa needing basic industrial infrastructure, you know, your, your railways, your roads, your ports, your energy plants. African countries not having the kind of financial war chest needed and with Western lenders kind of reluctant to invest in massive infrastructure and the Chinese kind of coming and saying, hey, you know, we can do this. Not only can we provide the finance, but we can provide the skilled workers, we can provide the construction companies you know, what option does Africa have? China's revenue from construction projects in Africa skyrocketed from the early 2000s to now, but it's dropped off a bit since around 2015. While it's not clear how long the money will keep flowing, China's railways in Africa are laying the tracks for a long-term relationship between the two locations. If that partnership lasts, then China's railway legacy could stretch far beyond its own borders. One of the world's most ambitious construction projects is being built right here, in the middle of a desert. Six of the Middle East's wealthiest countries have come together to construct a railway that will stretch for more than 2,000 kilometers and better connect the region. But with desert sands to cross and mountains to tunnel through, the project's challenges are immense and matched only by the price tag that comes with tackling them. If it works, the new line could unite the Gulf, reshape its transportation sector, reduce its carbon footprint and kickstart a whole new era of economic development. Welcome to the $100 billion railway in the desert. Before we get into how the railway is built, it's important to understand why it's being built in the first place. Let's start here, February 1981 in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Leaders from Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Bahrain and Oman met to form a political and economic alliance called the Gulf Cooperation Council, or GCC. As a group, they've made a lot of money off oil and gas, and that means their economies are largely tied to the oil market. 
Now, around 2008-2009, oil prices plummeted amid the Great Recession, and the GCC economies took a hit. That's where the railway comes in. Diversifying the economies of the Gulf states away from oil and gas will help them develop stronger economies. And uh, the railway lines will help, for example, will connect the nation's ports with manufacturing hubs. It will connect nation's ports with urban centers. In 2009, the GCC approved a massive railway project that would link all six member states. The cost would be divided among the countries, with the entire project estimated to be between 100 and 250 billion US dollars. The most expensive elements being Saudi Arabia's metro project and Etihad Railway, an 11 billion dollar, 1,200 kilometer freight and passenger railway that stretches across the Emirates from the Gulf of Oman to the Persian Gulf. The country's first national rail network is being constructed in two stages. The first was completed in 2016 and spans 264 kilometers from the Habshan and Shah areas in Abu Dhabi to the port of Ruais. In the popular perception, the uh, Arab Gulf states are flat, desert countries, and to some extent that is certainly the case, but in the northern parts of uh, the Emirates and northern parts of Oman, they have rugged mountains that reach 3,000 meters in elevation. Parts of this railway system have been just as challenging as building a railway system in the Rocky Mountains of the US. It's a tough working environment, to say the least. It can get so hot in the summer that some construction sites operate at night when temperatures are closer to a cool 30 degrees Celsius. That's around 86 Fahrenheit. Sand makes for difficult shifting terrain. Etihad learned from others who'd built in the desert, including China, Saudi Arabia, and Mauritania. Those nations found solutions like turning sand dunes to clay over many years, monitoring the shifting dunes, and planting walls of vegetation to block wind and sand. Etihad Rail's locomotive design includes a sand filtration system and a sand plow to help it navigate the desert. In Stage 1, Etihad Rail constructed 20 overbridges, 2 underbridges, 10 road underpasses and 18 smaller underpasses for future use. The company also built two factories to produce concrete railway sleepers made from locally sourced raw materials which form the base of the tracks. Each sleeper is 2.6 metres long and weighs 340 kilograms. They're attached to the main rails with a fastening system and are used to help stabilize the track and ensure the train can travel smoothly at speeds of up to 200 km an hour for passenger services. But this first route isn't transporting passengers just yet. Instead, it's carrying up to 22,000 tons of granulated sulfur across 110 wagons each day. The element is extracted from the oil fields in Abu Dhabi and processed for export at the port of Ruwais, where it goes on to be used in manufacturing everything from batteries to fertilizers and even fireworks. Etihad Rails transported more than 30 million tonnes of granulated sulphur for the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company as of mid-2021. They say that a single train journey reduces carbon dioxide emissions by 70-80% to compared to if those trips were made by trucks. That's pretty significant for an economy with one of the biggest carbon footprints in the world. The efficiencies also helped make the Emirates the world's top exporter of sulfur, bringing in $679 million in 2019. Much of that sulfur likely went to China, the world's largest importer, who also happens to be involved in stage two of the project. Stage 2 construction began in 2020 and will extend the network 605 kilometers from Guayfat on the border with Saudi Arabia to Vajaira on the east coast. A 408 million US dollar contract put China State Construction Engineering Corporation and South Korea's SK Engineering and Construction in charge of the design and building of 139 kilometers of rail line. Once complete, the network will link the country's major industrial ports and trading centers, enabling more than 50 million tons of goods to be transported each year. 
a country like Saudi Arabia and a country like the United Arab Emirates, they are huge in area and they contain immense potential for other natural resources that could and would be developed in the next few decades. And a railway would help these governments tap these so far untapped natural resources. Even with progress being made on the Etihad rail network, the GCC rail project as a whole hasn't always gone according to plan. They briefly blocked Qatar from the organization, putting its role in the railway project into question. And the pandemic and oil prices have caused logistical delays and cuts to infrastructure spending, which have pushed the completion date back by years. The vision of Gulf leaders has emerged from being a vision of uh, ambition and sometimes unrealistic ambition to a vision of pragmatism. Etihad hasn't said exactly when the railway will be open for commuters yet, but when it is, it might be a tough sell for a country that loves its cars. One 2020 survey in the UAE found that 83% of people depend on cars, while only 13% use public transport. It's primarily an economic value at this point, and the human side is not fully developed yet. And if there's a question around this project, it will be about the willingness of the population to jump on the railway line and to go from city to city. Still, the railway is a huge part of these countries' plans to become more sustainable and diversify their economies. And it's given rise to a new industry, which means new jobs. Both Saudi Arabia and the Emirates have developed rail studies training programs. The Gulf economies have grown exponentially over the last three decades or so. And the railway lines are more of a complement to the immense economic growth that the Gulf states have experienced over the last little bit. The Emirates may be known for its oil wealth and glitzy futuristic developments, but Etihad Railway is a glimpse into leaders' long-term strategy to build a more connected, unified Gulf. Cultural shifts take time, technological shifts can happen more or less overnight. If you enjoyed this video and you want to get more from the definitive video channel for construction, subscribe to the B1M.